Hello, everyone. Welcome to our final screencast in our unit on distributed word representations. Our topic is going to be deriving static representations from contextual models. That might sound awfully specific, but as you'll see, I think this could be really empowering for you as you work on your original system for the assignment and the associated bake-off. So let's dive in. A question on your minds might be, how can I use BERT or related models like Roberta or ExcelNet or Electra in the context of deriving good static representations of words? You probably have heard about these models and heard that they lift all boats. And the question is, how can you take advantage of those, of those benefits? But there's a tension here. We've been developing static representations, but these models like BERT are designed to deliver contextual representations of words. And I'll return to what that means in a second, but that is the central tension between static and contextual. So the question is, are there good methods for deriving static representations from the contextual ones that these models offer? And the answer from Balmasani et al. is yes. There are effective methods for doing this, and it's those methods that will be the focus of this screencast. I really want to do two things, though, for this lecture. I'd like to get hands-on a little bit with a high-level overview of models like BERT. We're going to look later in the quarter in much more detail at how these models work. So for now, we're just going to treat them as kind of black boxes, just like you might look up a glove representation of a word and just get back that representation and use it. So too here, we can think of these models as devices for feeding in sequences and getting back lots and lots of representations that we might use. And later in the quarter, we'll come to a deeper understanding of precisely where those representations come from. And in addition, of course, I want to give you an overview of these exciting methods from Bomasani et al. in the hopes that they are useful to you in developing your original system. So let's start with the structure of BERT. BERT processes sequences. Here I've got a sequence, the class token, the day broke SEP. Class and SEP are designated tokens. The class token typically starts the sequence and then SEP ends the sequence and can be also used internally in sequences to mark boundaries within the sequence that you're processing. But the fundamental thing is that we have this, this short sentence, the day broke. BERT processes those into an embedding layer and then a lot of additional layers. You know, here I've depicted four, but it could be 12 or even 24 layers. What we're seeing here, the, vec the rectangles represent vectors. They are the outputs of each layer in the network. A lot of computation goes into computing those output vector representations at each layer. We're gonna set that computation aside for now so that we can just think of this as a grid of vector representations. Here's the crucial thing that makes BERT contextual. For different sequences that we process, we will get very different representations. In fact, individual tokens occurring in different sequences will get very different representations. I've tried to signal that with the colors here. So like the T's two sequences both contain the word the and the word broke, but in virtue of the fact that they have different surrounding material and different positions in the sequence, almost all of the representations will be different. Um, the class and set tokens might have the same embedding, but through all of these layers, because of the way all these tokens are going to interact with each other when we derive the representations, everything will be different. We do not get a static representation out of these models. And I've specified that even in the embedding layer, if the positions of the words vary, one and the same token will get different representations. And the reason for that is that this embedding layer is actually hiding two components. We do at, at the very center of this model have a fixed static embedding where we can look up individual word sequences. But for this thing that I've called the embedding layer, that static representation is combined with a separate positional encoding from a separate embedding space. And that delivers what I've called the embedding layer here. And that means that even at this first layer, because for example, the occurs in different points in the sequence, it will get different representations even in the embedding space. And from there, of course, as we travel through these layers, we expect even more things to change about the representations. A second important preliminary is to give some attention to how BERT and models like it tokenize sequences. And here I've given you a bit of code in the hopes that you can get hands on and get a feel for how these tokenizers behave. I'm taking advantage of the Hugging Face library. I have loaded a BERT tokenizer and I load that from a pre-trained model. In cell three, you can see that I've called the tokenize function on the sentence, this isn't too surprising. And the result is a pretty normal looking sequence of tokens. You see some punctuation has been separated off, but you also see a lot of words. When you get down to cell four though, for the sequence encode me, 
this is a bit surprising, the word in code in the input has been broken apart into two subword tokens, en and then code with these boundary markers on it. BERT has broken that apart into two subword sequences. And if I feed in a sequence that has a really unfamiliar set of um, tokens in it, it will do a lot of breaking apart of that sequence, as you can see in cell five for the input Snuffleupagus, where a lot of these pieces have come out. This is the essential piece for why BERT is able to have such a small vocabulary, only about 30,000 words. Compare that with the 400,000 words that are in the glove space. The reason that it can get away with that is that it does a lot of breaking apart of words into sub word tokens. And of course, because the model is contextual, we have an expectation that, for example, when it encounters code here in the context of EN, at some conceptual level, the model will recognize that it has processed the word encode, even though it was two tokens underlyingly. Let's flesh this out a bit by looking at the full interface for dealing with these models. I'm again taking advantage of hugging face. I'm going to load a BERT model and a BERT tokenizer. It's important that they use the same pre-trained weights, which Hugging Face will download for you from the web. And so those are tied in and I set up the tokenizer and the model. If I call tokenizer.encode on a sequence, it will give me back a list of indices. And those indices will be used as a lookup to start the process of computing this entire sequence. In cell six, I actually use the model to derive that grid of representations. Hugging Face is giving us an object that has a lot of attributes. If I call output hidden states equals true when I use the model here, then I can call dot hidden states and get that full grid of representations that I showed you before. So this is a sequence with 13 layers. That's one embedding layer plus 12 of the additional layers. Uh, and if I key into one of like the first layer, that will be the embedding. You can see that its shape is one by five by 768. This is a batch of one example. It has five tokens, the three that we can see here plus the class and set tokens. And each one of those tokens in the embedding layer is represented by a ve vector of dimension 768. And that remains consistent through all the layers in the model. So if I went to the final output states, I again just index into dot hidden states here. The shape is the same, and that will be consistent for all the layers. Those are the preliminaries. And let's think about how we could derive some static representations. The first approach that Bomasani and all consider is what they call the decontextualized approach. And this is like the simplest thing possible. We are just going to process individual words as though they were sequences and see if Bert can make any sense of them. So we would start by feeding in a word like kitten, and we would allow the model to break it apart into its subword pieces. And then we simply process that with the model, and we get a full grid of representations. Now, because we potentially have subword tokens here, we need some pooling function. So what we could do is just pool using something like mean to get a fixed static representation of dimension 768 for this individual word. And of course, we don't have to use the final layer. We could use lower down layers. And we don't have to use mean as the pooling function. You could consider something like max or min or even last, which would just disregard all of the vector representations except for the one corresponding to the final subword token. This is really simple. Uh, it's potentially unnatural though. BERT is a contextual model. It was trained on full sequences. And especially if we leave off the class and set tokens, we might be feeding in sequences that BERT has really never seen before. And so it might be unknown how it's gonna behave with these unusual inputs. Nonetheless though, we could repeat this process for all the words in our vocabulary and derive a static embedding space. And maybe it has some promise. However, to, to address this potential unnaturalness and potentially take more advantage of the, the virtues that BERT and related models have, Bomasani et al. consider also the aggregated approach. So in this approach, you process lots of corpus examples that contain your target word. Here I've got a sort of glimpse of a corpus. Our target word is kitten. Of course, we allow it to be broken apart into subword tokens. The full sequences in these examples would also be broken apart into subword tokens. Uh, but the important thing is that our target word might have subword tokens. We pool those as we did before for the decontextualized approach. And we're also going to pool across all of the different context examples that we processed. And the result of that should be a bunch of natural inputs to the model. But in the end, we derive a static representation that is some kind of average across all of the examples that we processed. 
This seems very natural. It's taking advantage of what, what BERT is best at. I will warn you though, that this is very computationally demanding. We're gonna to wanna to process lots of examples and BERT requires lots of resources because it develops really large representations as we've seen, but it might be worth it. Now, Bomasani et al. offer lots of results that help us understand these approaches and how they perform. Uh, let me give you a glimpse of them as a kind of summary. So what we've got here is results for the SimVerb 3500 dataset a word similarity data set that's very similar to the ones that you'll be working with on the homework and Bake Off. Our metric is Spearman correlation and higher is better. That's along the Y axis. And along the X axis, I have the layer in the model that we're keying into. And then of course, what we should watch is that we have two pooling functions, F and G. F is subword pooling and G is context pooling for models that have it. And it's decont for the decontextualized approach. Now we have a very clear result across these results and I think across all the results in the paper, lower layers are better. Lower layers are giving us good high fidelity representations of individual words. As we travel higher in the model, we seem to lose a lot of that word level discrimination. In addition, your best choice is to do mean pooling for the context and subword pooling seems to matter less, right? All of these lines here are all for the context pooling model with mean as your context pooling function. The very best choice though, I think consistently is mean for both of these pooling functions here. Um, you can see that in this result and I think that's consistent across all the results in the paper. But the overall takeaway here is that as expected, the aggregated approach is better than the decontextualized approach. However, if you don't have the computational budget for that, then mean pooling in the decontextualized approach looks really competitive. That's not so evident in this plot, but if you look across all the results in the paper, I think that's a pretty clear finding. So that would be a good choice. And one thing is clear, that simple approach is better than some kinds of context pooling where you choose the wrong context pooling function like min or max. Despite all of the effort that went into this set of results and also these, they're all kind of down here entangled with the decontextualized approach but mean as the pooling function there is really an outstanding choice as you can see from these results.